Our next presenter is Christina Seshik. She's a medical doctor with a specialty in medical informatics, and she will be speaking about uh, the value of patient data on the black market. Uh, if you have any questions at the end of the lecture, please go to the microphone that's standing there. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is uh, basically um, a continuation and uh, opening a new field um, uh, in relation to my uh, talk from yesterday, uh, but you don't uh, need to have seen it uh, to follow this one. So, uh, to um, introduce um, this topic, I would like to ask you, um, have any of you had any medical problems in the last 12 months? Okay, I see lots of hands. Um, I will not ask any of you what exactly um, you have had trouble with, uh, but um, I ask you to uh, visualize. Uh, if I did um, ask you to present it uh, to the audience, uh, what you would feel like. If, for example, uh, the next slide uh, that I'm showing uh, would show exactly what you have been suffering of and uh, show your lab results um, from your doctor. Um, just think about that for a moment. Um, so, the research question for this talk is, um, is there a black market for patient data? Uh, and if so, um, two more questions uh, result, which are, how much uh, does one set of patient data cost on this black market, and why would people buy it? This is not um, a completed, solid research project. Uh, it, is, um, it has lots of open questions, and uh, I ask you um, if you have any comments, any own experiences, uh, any views on the subject or questions um, to um, uh, seize the chance uh, to talk about it um, after the talk when we have the microphone open. So, uh, to start, um, what we are talking about is personal health data or patient data. Um, what exactly is personal health data? Uh, it includes um, anything that you can think of that somehow relates to your health. It's not only um, uh, data from your doctor, like current uh, or previous diagnosis or suspected diagnosis, but also uh, all kinds of information uh, relating to your family um, and to your habits. And uh, something that uh, most people don't know, even the fact that you consulted a doctor um, is part of your personal health data and um, you should be able to keep it confidential if you wish so. So who is interested in patient data? Um, the first group of course um, are doctors and nurses and other medical professionals, um, other therapists uh, that of course need this data to do their jobs properly. Then um, another group um, are researchers at university or um, at uh, private institutions um, who want uh, to use um, patient data, uh, for example, to conduct uh, clinical studies um, or develop um, new uh, pharmaceuticals um, and yeah, anything related to that. Which leads to the next group, um, pharma companies. Uh, they, of course, are also interested in patient data for two purposes. Um, the first, like researchers, um, uh, the first purpose is they want to develop uh, new therapies and uh, new drugs. And the second is they also want to market these. And uh, in order to do this, they also need um, patient data. Uh, then one group that uh, maybe one doesn't uh, think of right away uh, are insurance companies. Um, for them, uh, patient data is very, very interesting um, because they want to uh, calculate your risk 
of dying or falling sick. If you are applying um, for um, life insurance, for example, or for other kinds of um, uh, private insurance. Basically, um, the more likely you are to get sick or die, the more expensive you are to them. Then another group that is increasingly also interested in patient data are consumer-oriented companies, uh, especially in uh, the last few months and years um, with the uh, increasing development uh, of, um, for example, wearables or quantified self-apps. And then last but not least, there is uh, the patient himself or herself who's also interested in keeping uh, his or her own data. Um, and patients have a couple of different attitudes um, about sharing their data. Uh, most, uh, or let's say many, uh, haven't really thought about it. Um, then there are some uh, that are very open and um, let's say just take what you need. I'm, uh, I'm confident that you will use it uh, to help me in some way. Uh, there are some that uh, just don't uh, want to cooperate with their data. Um, although this group is often uh, the same group that uh, doesn't like to consult uh, doctors at all. Um, and yeah, something um, that should not be forgotten is um, when you are a patient, you often um, have much larger problems than thinking about your data. Uh, usually your main objective is uh, getting healthy and not um, thinking about data sharing policies. Um, but in generally, uh, the informed patient, that is the patient that is not too sick to think about it, um, wants to share some of the data with some parties. So as we've seen, um, personal health data has value to um, a couple of different uh, groups. Um, and if it has value, then uh, it should be possible to define this value in a financial way. There are two ways to do that. Um, they are, by the way, applicable to any kind of personal data, not only personal health data. The first is um, you look at individual valuation. Uh, that is, you ask uh, individuals um, either how much they would be willing to pay to protect their data, or the other way around, um, uh, how, um, how much they would expect as compensation if they were to um, sell their data. This is the first way. Um, the second way is uh, based on market valuation, where you don't uh, ask an individual, but a group of people or um, the market. Um, there are again uh, a couple of different ways uh, to do that. Um, one uh, maybe rather easy way would be to look at uh, a company uh, that uh, processes uh, patient data. Uh, and then you take the uh, company's revenue and divide it through the number of um, data records um, that it uses and then uh, you get um, the, the fraction or um, a revenue number per data record. Um, another way is to look at the cost of a data breach. Um, this uh, consists of a number of different, uh, different uh, figures you have to think about uh, compensating the victims of a data breach, uh, of spending money for PR uh, to correct your image with the press, uh, a cost to increase your security, uh, etc. Uh, and then the last uh, two ways are either to look at the regular market price uh, for data, because there's also something like that, not only the black market, uh, and uh, the topic of this talk, to look at the black market price for data. Um, surprisingly, this is not very well investigated for health data, um, which is uh, the reason why I started looking into this. Uh, I was surprised that uh, there were um, relatively little information um, about the topic. 
So this is one reason to look at the black market price, um, to correctly estimate the value of personal health data. And then uh, there is uh, another reason, which is maybe uh, even more obvious or more important. Uh, it is to find out about the motivation of this guy, or this guy, or this uh, woman, or him. Um, as a side note, I uh, urge you to look at this URL after my talk, uh, uh, the funniest hacker stock photos. So we want to look at the motivations of attackers uh, that um, target personal health data. Uh, to do that, first I have some uh, numbers for you. Um, in 2015, uh, criminal attacks were the most frequent cause of data breaches in healthcare for the first time ever. Uh, if you compare it to uh, results from 2010, um, there is an increase in 125% uh, US data. So the um, vast majority of healthcare organizations um, uh, in 2015 had suffered at least two data breaches um, in the last two years, and uh, most had even uh, suffered more than that. Yeah, as I said earlier, criminal attack was um, the most frequent cause for the first time in history. And um, the kind of patient data that was most frequently um, successfully targeted was indeed medical files, including patient history, uh, current diagnosis, current medication, etc. Uh, something that is uh, obviously also interesting um, are billing and insurance records, uh, payment details, um, so uh, in summary all kinds of financial information. Um, I will show you some uh, incidents in detail. Uh, first, some from the US, which are um, very uh, well documented in comparison uh, to other countries. Um, in 2015, there were actually lots of them in the US. Um, this is the largest data breach that ever happened in uh, healthcare anywhere in the world um, that we know of, of course. Um, in the for-profit health insurance company Anthem, um, about 80 million records of customers and employees um, were stolen, uh, including social security numbers, birthdays, addresses, employment information, etc. Um, and the way the attackers did this was to use malware and uh, to gain an employee's login information. <coughs> A similar incident um, uh, was uh, happened at Primera Blue Cross, a non-profit uh, insurer. Um, 11, million, 11 million patient records, this time also including medical information. Um, this was a phishing attack and they used the fake, uh, fake domain Primera.com. Um, so a similar one with 10, 10 million records, um, Excellus Blue Cross, Blue Shield, um, social security numbers and financial data and a smaller one which affected the UCLA health system that's not an insurer but um, uh, a medical center that includes uh, hospitals and private practices um, again including medical information which was stored without any encryption. So here are some uh, German incidents um, not restricted uh, to um, IT attacks uh, the first one uh, is the case of an IT admin um, who was employed in a medical data center uh, who copied data uh, from backup tapes from hospitals and doctor's offices. Um, the reason why he did this, um, I think, uh, was never made entirely clear. Uh, then there are some incidents where um, data was stolen physically. Um, backup tapes, in this case, uh, the um, mechanism was uh, that one employee was sent uh, to take these backup tapes to the storage facility. Um, he then went for a cigarette break and as he came back the tapes were gone. Um, the hospital since then uh, implemented a policy that no one um, may ever go alone to take these backup tapes to the um, storage facility. 
then in another uh, instance, um, endoscopy equipment was stolen. Um, that's the kind of medical device that uh, is used um, to look into your stomach or, or the other way around. Uh, and it also has um, internal storage to store patient data. So whenever one of these gets stolen, then the data um, on it uh, gets stolen as well. And um, something that sounds kind of old fashioned, but has uh, happened recently is um, that uh, physical patient files uh, on, on paper um, from uh, hospitals that went out of business were actually um, left in those buildings and uh, an interested reporter or um, just about anyone could drive there with a van and uh, uh, pack these patient files and drive away. And then a few words about ransomware. Um, there uh, were many infections uh, in hospitals with uh, several um, types of ransomware in 2016. Uh, especially in Germany and the US, but also in Canada and New Zealand. Um, but uh, I didn't make this the focus of my talk because it's not a theft um, in a strict sense. It's a more like a hostage situation with uh, data. So why does uh, data theft um, happen in healthcare? Um, analysts say that uh, one reason why um, it is uh, possible is that um, uh, defenses in healthcare systems are inferior to the defenses in other industries, like for example uh, the banking industry, um, who have been uh, working hard on their defenses for quite a long time. The second is, um, as we saw previously, that health data is uh, inherently valuable. Um, it is useful not only for um, the patient and for uh, related professionals, but obviously also to um, hypothetical attacker. So what is the financial worth of patient data? Um, the FBI estimates that one set of patient records is worth 50 US dollars. Um, a company, um, uh, Fish Labs, which offers cybercrime protection, um, estimates the worth a bit lower at uh, 10 US dollars. And yet another company, uh, Beasley, says that it is between 40 and 50 US dollars. Uh, as a side note, um, in ransomware, uh, the, the victims are usually asked to pay uh, 200 to 300 US dollars per attack, and every attack um, includes uh, several hundreds uh, to thousands of patient files. Um, but in single cases, in uh, targeted attacks, um, several million US dollars have been uh, demanded as a ransom. Um, so I will look in detail at um, the largest known transaction uh, with patient data uh, on the black market, which happened on the black marketplace, the real deal. The seller was someone who called himself the dark overlord. Uh, and he put up his offers uh, in two steps. On the first day, he offered uh, 655,000 records, um, which were taken from uh, three victims. And on the second day, um, nine million records from another victim. In the first three, three cases, um, as he said himself, um, he used usernames and passwords that were stored without encryption in databases that were accessible in misconfigured networks. Um, the fourth case was different. He there exploited a vulnerability in Windows Remote uh, Desktop Protocol. This is a screenshot um, of the patient data. Uh, he gave a sample of his data to an independent uh, journalist working for Deep.Web. Uh, and this journalist was then able to verify um, the data. Um, I think it's not, it's not really leg legible for um, all in the audience, but I can say here, um, you can see, uh, you can't see, uh, but you could uh, see the um, patient's family history, the diseases that um, his parents affected. Um, you can see that he used to be a smoker, that he has carpal tunnel syndrome, um, uh, that he is being treated with an uh, opiate. 
um, yeah, and all kinds of sensitive uh, personal information. Uh, selling this was not uh, the Dark Overlord's um, first uh, plan. Um, actually, he first attempted to extort money from uh, the victims. In one case, he asked uh, the hospital to pay 160,000 US dollars. In the other cases, uh, the ransom sum is not known, but um, he himself said that he demanded less than one million dollars in uh, every case. But when uh, each one of the victims declined, he put this offer on the real deal. Um, there, he priced uh, his largest database at 500,000 US dollars, um, if, if you use the Bitcoin rate from June 2016. That leads to a price of only five US cents per record. Why so low? Um, there are several reasons. In this case, of course, um, I think a bulk discount comes into play uh, because no one would be either willing or able to pay 500 million US dollars um, for this huge database. Uh, then, of course, he's uh, basically doing recycling uh, of his heast um, because his first intention was a different one. He wanted to uh, extort money. And then um, the third reason may be that uh, he already had concerns about the data quality um, because this independent journalist I mentioned before um, checked some of the data. He actually went and called the patients. And um, this way he found out that some of the data was um, already expired and uh, not, not really current anymore. So the question is, um, uh, if there are databases like this um, put up for sale, who's willing to buy and uh, why would they buy it? Um, the business models behind this um, are uh, on the one hand uh, confirmed um, business models. Uh, that means things that have already happened. Um, one of them is of course extortion. Um, you can um, extort the institutions that the data is coming from, um, but you also have um, leverage against the individual patients. So both of this um, is possible. Then something that is, um, I think, quite specific uh, to the US healthcare system is medical identity theft. Um, which means you use another person's data um, to gain access to their health insurance and um, to get a diagnosis and treatment that your own insurance does not cover. Um, since there are lots of um, uninsured individuals in the US, um, this is a valid uh, business model. Um, however, in other systems it's not. Uh, in Germany, um, most of the population are insured, um, and this, uh, for this kind of identity theft, there's just not uh, the same motivation. But um, you can use the same data to perform uh, other kinds of identity theft. Uh, you don't, uh, on, don't only have um, uh, medical information, but uh, uh, dates like uh, birth date, address, um, financial data, and you can take this and uh, perform identity theft, for example, to gain um, access to uh, bank accounts. And uh, the last uh, confirmed uh, business model, um, that is something that does happen sometimes, uh, is uh, selling the medical data of uh, VIPs to the tabloid media. Um, this has happened uh, in cases like, for example, uh, the death of Michael Jackson um, and uh, the death or serious uh, disease of um, any kind of uh, actor or singer um, or a person of um, public interest. Um, in contrast uh, to um, this buying and selling of huge databases, this uh, should be a targeted attack. Um, so um, I would guess that it is most likely to succeed if you target um, 
for example, a doctor or a nurse um, of whom you know that they are treating um, a certain individual. Uh, if you buy a huge database, um, of course, you can uh, speculate that there may be someone interesting in it, but I'm not sure if that would be uh, as um, successful and uh, provide a good, um, uh, let's say, return on investment. Uh, something that may be happening, but we don't know, um, is the use of data for foreign espionage. Um, something like this has been hypothesized in uh, one of the data breach cases I showed you earlier, uh, namely uh, Anthem. Uh, there, some analysts said um, that the attacks seemed to come from China, and they thought uh, that maybe the Chinese government was interested in uh, gaining insights into the economic and social conditions that these data provide. But as I said, this hasn't been confirmed so far. And another thing that is uh, pure speculation is that uh, medical data would also be interesting for private companies like health insurers and uh, research and development. But um, uh, to my knowledge, no instance of a private company buying uh, these kind of data on the black market has been reported. Of course, you would expect that um, in each of these, um, uh, each of these uh, theories uh, or business models, there is a large amount of unrecorded cases. Uh, so to summarize, um, the theft of healthcare data uh, is um, on the rise. Uh, the prices of a single set of patient data seem to vary between 5 US cents and 50 US dollars uh, per record. Um, there is a variety of business models behind it. Um, the most important ones are extortion and identity theft. And um, there are certainly a high number of unrecorded cases. So um, thank you for your attention so far. Um, I would appreciate any uh, questions uh, and uh, comments that you may have. Thank you for another interesting talk. Um, I'm curious. Uh, uh, now is it good? Yeah. Um, since you're a doctor, yes, while you were investigating this, were you concerned at all that maybe some spy agency would think that you're trying to sell your patient's data on the black market? Um, no. Um, as, as I said in one of the first slides, um, it caught my attention when I saw that uh, data breaches in healthcare were being reported. And I asked myself, um, if someone is stealing it, then why? What, what, what's the motivation? And um, yeah, I started Googling it, and there was, no, uh, there was no easy answer. And I thought, why is that? There, there's lots of literature um, about uh, data theft in banking and uh, how to buy credit card data and whatever. Um, but uh, healthcare seemed uh, to be like a blind spot in that regard. So this uh, just struck my fancy. Hi, I think it's a very interesting topic because uh, it's like a new and emerging market. For instance, here in Serbia, I don't know about Novi Sad and Belgrade, but in my hometown, Panchevo, a few months ago, they, they started using uh, full electronic patient charts. And uh, I had some experience with working for a hospital, and I know that uh, they don't take, uh, they don't, uh, understand the risks and that they don't take security seriously. So passwords of users using computers are written down, uh, patients or someone who is looking 
for some data can sometimes even get physical access to the computers. And uh, for instance, I know that uh, connections between the different locations of hospitals in the city are connected with VPN that is not encrypted. I also know that they use the equipment that is not like secure and so on. So I think that uh, Serbia will be a hunting ground for, for uh, people trying to sell this kind of data. I also think uh, you mentioned correctly that uh, insurance companies but also pharmaceutical companies are interested in this kind of data because it can tell them in which directions to, to put money so I think they will be giving money maybe even to the black market. Yes, yes, I think so. And the problems you mentioned um, are, not, are not specific to Serbia. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, yeah, about the motivation uh, to buy data on the black market, I think for consumer-oriented companies, um, this is still maybe um, not really necessary because there are lots of ways um, they can make consumers give up their personal health information uh, voluntarily. Uh, if you think about all kinds of um, health apps and uh, quantified self apps that um, send your data somewhere and not um, every one of its users um, ever bothers to find out where the data is being sent. So um, consumer oriented companies, they have their own ways of getting data and um, so maybe they are not as likely um, to buy through these dark channels. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> when this, uh, the data you talked about, or the one you show on the screenshot, had all sorts of personal information about the patients. So is there anything in the sense of also selling anonymized data from the users? So selling only the relevant parts to medical research or whatever? Um, yeah, that, that can actually be done on regular markets. Okay. So it's how, how, was the price, how the price goes on the regular market for this kind of information? Um, honestly, I don't know that. I would have to look that up. Mm. If, um, if you're interested, uh, you can send me an email and uh, I will try to find out. Okay. Um, so if there are no more uh, questions and uh, comments now, ah, there's one more. Mm -hmm. Hi, I come from uh, hospital too, so uh, how your colleague react about uh, protection from uh, data, what uh, they know about that and danger of selling data? Um, People from the hospital who work yeah. there, what is your experience? I, I um, touched a bit about the subject yesterday. Um, uh, um, the security of data often um, is uh, compromised uh, um, because convenience is more important uh, than security in, in a certain moment. Um, I think this is the number one reason of uh, uh, why, why data are insecure in the healthcare sector. Um, and I think that uh, many people know about um, the risks uh, to um, uh, patient data safety um, and they are willing to implement some security but only if it's not too inconvenient. Um, but I think there's also a high number of people um, that uh, don't really know about um, the risk of data theft. Um, and this is also one of the reasons why I was interested in this um, subject because um, when you think about it as a, as a person who works in healthcare but has never uh, been um, educated on the subject of data security, then um, your first thought um, uh, may be, uh, well, who, who would be interested? Who, who, wants to, who wants this data? What can you do with it? Uh, just uh, data of some random persons that you may never have seen, uh, it, it doesn't have any value. Um, I think that may be the first thought of a person that is um, naive to the subject. 
Um, and uh, I think that's a justified question. Uh, and one of the reasons why I chose to investigate a bit. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, as I said yesterday, um, I'm still available um, here on uh, the conference and um, of course via email. Uh, I uh, will be happy to um, hear about uh, any more uh, comments and uh, questions by email. And thank you again for your attention.